Russia had been steadily losing territory for over three months now, and six weeks ago even lost Lemberg, the capital of Galicia. But this week, it gets even worse. For this week, the Germans take Warsaw. I'm Indy Nidell. This is The Great War. Last week, the war celebrated its first birthday in a previously unheard of manner. On the Western Front, the Germans used flamethrowers effectively for the first time at Hooge. The Armenian genocide continued in eastern Anatolia, and at sea, more ships carrying civilians were torpedoed. On the Eastern Front, the Russians ended the week retreating along their entire line as they also evacuated Warsaw and Riga from advancing German armies. And at home in Petrograd, there was a very real fear of what was to become of the army as desertion, surrender, and revolutionary propaganda became epidemic in the field. Italy was on the move and way away to the south, South Africa annexed the former German colony of Southwest Africa. We're going to look at Russia first today, specifically what was going on in the Polish salient, where the Germans and Austrians had been tightening the noose for weeks. The Russian fortress of Ivangorod, besieged throughout the week from all sides, could hold out no longer and was abandoned. Austrian forces triumphantly entered August 4th. The Russian retreat from Warsaw, which had been nearly surrounded by this time, began the night of August 3rd, though the city had already been stripped of things like medals from church bells and usable machinery. The Germans arrived on August 5th at 6 a.m., and Prince Leopold of Bavaria formally took command of the city. This was an enormous prize. The Russians were without control of the city for the first time in a hundred years, and the Germans now set their long-term sights towards Finland, which had belonged to Russia since 1808, when Russia had taken it from Sweden. The fall of Warsaw was a big blow for Russia, and the war was in motion this week on the whole Eastern Front, and way to the south at Gallipoli, men were trying to get that front into motion again and break the stalemate. This week, British forces would try yet again to break through and launched an attack at Suvla Bay. The goal was to link up with Anzac, Australian and New Zealander, positions further south and finally drive the Turks off the high ground at Chunuk Bayer and the even higher Koja Chemen Tepe. Now there were two diversionary attacks planned to draw Turkish forces away from the high ground. The first was above Anzac Cove at Lone Pine and the Australians managed to penetrate the Turkish lines in a bloodbath. When they consolidated the newly taken trenches, over a thousand Turkish bodies had to be carried out of them and there were another 4,000 Turkish casualties. The Australians took only 1,700. The second diversion was at Cape Helles, once again for the umpteenth time trying to take the village of Krithia and the heights of Akibaba. This attack was not as successful as the first, but both of these were successful as diversions, as Australian, New Zealander, Indian, and British troops successfully landed at Suvla Bay, overcame the defenders, crossed the coastal plain, headed towards the hills, and then stopped. See, these men were by now used to Western Front victories of 50 or 100 yards. Now that they had a half mile of unopposed advance in front of them, they didn't really know what to do. So they hesitated and failed to advance. That night, further south, 16,000 Australian troops headed northward from Anzac Cove to take Koja Chementepe. Now, at Koja Chementepe was Colonel Hans Kanengieser, but he had just gotten there. He had initially gone to Lone Pine with a Turkish division, but since he missed the action there, he headed for the high ground. So he got to see, by the dawn's early light, a huge column of 16,000 Australians advancing 300 yards below. Kanengieser only had 20 men with him. So he ordered them to lie down and open fire. The Australians thought they were facing a much bigger force, so they too lay down and took cover. And by the time the deception was realized, General Lehman von Sanders had arrived at the summit with two Ottoman regiments, and the Turks held the heights. Further south, a New Zealand battalion had reached the top of Chunuk Bayer with no opposition. At the top, they found one Turkish machine gun and its sleeping crew. But Turkish troops on spurs on each side of Chunuk Bayer, on Hill Q and Battleship Hill, opened fire on the New Zealanders and prevented reinforcements from arriving. And that's how things stood there at the end of the week. A little Gallipoli side note here. On August 1st, the Galata Bridge in Constantinople was blown up by British subs. British technology was certainly improving, but if you look around Europe, it was the Germans whose innovations were the big things. Their U-boats were feared by all shipping. Their poison gas was the terror of troops on the Western Front, their artillery on the Eastern one. 
they had just begun using flamethrowers successfully, which added yet another element of terror to their arsenal. And now, as of the beginning of August 1915, they ruled the skies as the Fokker Scourge began. The Fokker Eindecker were single-seat fighter planes developed by Dutchman Anthony Fokker. They were not only the first German fighter planes built, they were the first of all planes outfitted with synchronization gear, which allowed the pilot to fire his machine gun through the propeller so he could aim the gun just by aiming the plane. This was a major innovation. Fokker demonstrated the plane back on May 23rd, and now, as the summer dragged on, with planes in the hands of Oswald Belke and Max Immelmann, Germany unquestionably had the flying advantage. The Allied aviators even soon began to refer to their own planes as Fokker fodder. The Fokker Scourge also really marked the beginning of the age of the flying aces. And though the Germans enjoyed a tactical advantage, they also had a huge psychological one. By the end of July, there were only around 15 Eindeckers in service, but that number would soon grow. One acute issue that Germany did have that occasionally limited just what could be produced was raw materials. Imports from overseas were, of course, cut off by the blockade. But way back at the beginning of the war, August 9, 1914, Walter Rathenau, a Jewish businessman, persuaded Erich von Falkenhayn, now German Army Chief of Staff, but at that time Minister of War, to establish a raw materials agency. Its first task was to take stock of raw materials not only within Germany, but also in occupied territories, especially Belgium. So they could then be centrally allocated to the companies that could make the best use of them. So each commodity had its own raw materials company. And that company had a board made up primarily from the companies that used that commodity. So whether or not the agency was successful, there were charges that the free market had been enlisted to serve the government, but with guaranteed profits. Here's the thing. A dramatic expansion of output and a shift to making things as quickly as possible had the big consequence of lowering standards a whole lot. Germany, for example, lost 2,300 field guns and 900 howitzers in 1915 because of premature explosions. That's the same amount that were disabled by enemy action. So expansion had taken over from quality control. Just thought I'd touch on the subject as long as I was talking about German technology. And so another week comes to an end, with the British troops looking surprisingly good at Gallipoli and a mostly quiet Western Front, though Germany took control of the skies. But the Eastern Front was in total upheaval as the Austro-German forces took Ivangorod and Warsaw. But what did that mean for Russia? Well, it was a big deal, but Warsaw had been right near enemy territory since the beginning of the war, so it had always been conceivable that it would fall. But there was something else brewing that, if it happened, would have far greater consequences in Petrograd. The German offensive up in the Baltic was something really scary, for it threatened Kovno, also called Kaunas, which was in Russian Lithuania and meant more to a Russian patriot than Polish territory did. But more than that, it was one of the strongest and greatest of the Russian fortresses and held an enormous amount of weapons, ammunition, and all kinds of provisions. Some of the advanced forts had fallen into German hands in July, and by the end of this week, it was under siege. And so we just keep seeing each week that things go worse and worse for the Russians, fighting and dying by the anonymous hundreds of thousands as their territory slips from their grasp. This was modern war. Today we talked about German weapons that seemed to be unstoppable at this point of the war. Especially notorious was the gas used on the Western Front. Now it was based on the research of one man, Fritz Haber. He played a major role in creating gas warfare, but also won a Nobel Prize after the war. You can find out how all that happened in our special episode about Fritz Haber right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Bernie Stern. Thank you, Bernie. If you want to find out more about supporting the show and get cool perks in return, check out our Patreon page. For more discussions on the show, check out our subreddit, and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.